Welcome to the Unstoppable Recording Machine Podcast, brought to you by Joey Sturgis Tones. Creating unique audio tools for musicians and producers everywhere. Unleash your creativity with Joey Sturgis Tones. Visit joeysturgistones.com for more info. And now your hosts, Joey Sturgis, Joe Wenasek, and A.L. Levy. Hey everyone, welcome. Welcome to the Unstoppable Recording Machine Podcast. I'm kind of sick today. Damn, so you sound if, sick, dude. If I sound like a mutant, then <laughs> this is Joey speaking. I should probably clarify that. Uh, today we have a really awesome guest, a good friend of ours, and I would consider one of the most badass people in this scene, Mr. Misha Mansoor. Hello, how are you? Hey, how you doing? With that intro, I almost thought uh, you had the, the you were introing the wrong person for a second there. <laughs> most, most badass, jeez. It's like the first time anyone other than my parents have called me badass. Thank you. <laughs> Dude, you deserve it. <laughs> yeah, you, you deserve it. I, I got to say that I don't know if you remember this, but me and you were emailing years ago, and I think it was right around the time that my guitar record, Avalanche of Worms, came out. I think that your first periphery record came out the same day. Something yeah, like I that. remember. I remember that's when we first started talking. I remember you sent that to yeah. me, and I was like, yo, this is crazy i was like i didn't know that someone can play guitar like that like <laughs> it was it was pretty it was pretty it's pretty nuts i was like damn <laughs> well i felt the same well thank you i felt the same way about periphery and i remember you being like i hope that people like it uh, and i think i think it's safe to say that people liked it well so, some people i think i some think people i think we're i think you know if we're honest, we've always been a very polarizing band. Um, I didn't realize just how much we would be then. Uh, some people liked it. Some people like it very much. Some people very much dislike it. But in hindsight, I think that's really worked to our advantage. Well, do you feel like it means anything if people just have a lukewarm response? I find that the best artists are polarizing. Um, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting thing because... I guess in terms of success, maybe it's it's probably a better thing. Like I just don't. I've never really cared, like especially with the way that that we started, which it was just you know me in my my bedroom making music. It was just kind of having fun, and that that was always the goal. So even if people thought it sucked, I still had fun making it, which was kind of the point. So that's always the way that that I've looked at it, and that's always the way that people have looked at it. But you know, being polarizing is just—it's just kind of interesting. You know, it's kind of interesting to see what people take away from it. Because regardless of what anyone will say, I'm very stubborn, so I'll always have my own point of view on it, and no one will really be able to change my mind on on whether that's positive or negative. Uh, if I think something sucks, no one will be able to convince me that something that I've done is good, even if they're you know sort of tell me like how much they love it it won't change anything i'll still think it sucks so <laughs> i'm kind of stubborn like that you know that's that's interesting one thing that i've always told people um is to in order to not get depressed over the bad not bad press but the bad just the bad comments the negativity you can't take the good stuff too seriously either it's like you can't have it both ways it's if you really want to not be affected by the negativity just try to not care what people think period if it's good or if it's bad just stay true to what's what's inside of you and what you actually think about it because like you said if you think you did something that sucks who cares what anybody else thinks because you're your own uh you know you're your own barometer basically yeah exactly that, that that's what i'm saying it's like but again that's not like a conscious decision on my part that's just me being really stubborn <laughs> i've always i've I'm, I'm it's just me being very me because i like what i like i i know what i like i know what i don't like that may change but in the moment i always know that and i know when something's uh hitting the mark and when it's not and when something's not quite there it doesn't matter what anyone says like it's not going to change that fact. There's only a few people in the world who can change my mind about that, and they'll be sort of band members or people that I'm working with who I trust musically, because that's why I'm working with them. But aside from that, and even then, that can be <laughs> that can be challenging. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's it's. I guess it's my relationship with my music, if that makes sense. You know, everyone has their own relationship with their music and their own process. So. 
this is by no means a judgment on people who do things differently. Um, yeah, it's of just course. the way it's, it's music's this weird thing. It's weird. It's a weird thing. And <laughs> is it still weird to you now years into it being your livelihood and you doing so many different things? Does it still have that, that weird personal thing yeah. that's harder to find? Yeah. I'm no, it's definitely, it's definitely a weird thing. Like, I I'm very appreciative of music and and obviously I love it but I have this very weird relationship with music. I have a very very weird relationship with music because it's like half love half resentment, you know? Like I I don't I still I still feel I still feel like a worthless musician, you know? Like that never went away. Uh, and I think I think if I've grown in any ways kind of maybe acceptance of the fact that that will never go away rather than trying to overcome that <laughs> because it seems like the better I get on a technical level or the more I work at this or that it's just the further away I realize I am from actually being good at anything so I've realized that the you know for me it's just having fun but there's also this guilt that comes with it now I'm gonna I'm gonna open up to you guys on this podcast um there's this open uh, up dude there's this uh there's this guilt that comes with it because you know We've seen a little bit of success and, you know, we're fortunate enough and I'm fortunate enough to make a living with music. So now there's this like expectation. There's this voice in the back of my head that's like, well, come on, you asshole. You got everything you wanted. You have your studio. You can make music anytime. Aren't you making music right now? You know, and that's not necessarily a healthy way to approach making music. You shouldn't be making music out of guilt. You should be making music because you want to. And it's just this interesting dichotomy, uh, this, this, <laughs> this, uh, sort of uh, battle that goes on in inside my head sometimes that I need to get over a little bit but yeah. I've actually had that same exact battle because um, it's like you think about people who would sell their own parents to have these types of I guess advantages or situations in their lives outcomes um, you know like the studio like having a fan base like any of those things and then Sometimes it's like, well, tonight I just don't want to make music. I just want to exactly. hang out. Exactly. And like that has to be a okay. mess with your head. <laughs> but that has that has to be OK by definition. I mean, if we if we look at it uh, on a very basic level, like why did I start making music? It's because I wanted to. It wasn't because like I felt an obligation to do so. And I think that honestly, it's a little bit of of a dynamic that maybe some people get tricked into into falling into uh and what i mean is like let's say like you're a band that's put out a a, a record and it does really well all of a sudden you have a pre you have pressure from from fans from label management from everyone to put out another one and usually that first record is a culmination of years and years of your best ideas and then this next one they're like all right well you know you're gonna have a couple months off between these two tours let's get a record together and it's like whoa come on man like that's not how that works, but but at the same time, now you have this pressure to do that, and you might be writing music when you don't necessarily want to write music, and that's an un an unhealthy dynamic in my mind that kind of gets put. Yeah, that's not a good thing. It's not. No, it's unhealthy, uh, and it's not going to yield good music, and that's where some resentment can start, I think, you know, is this idea that I have to. You started out by wanting to, and now you have to. And it's not that like you, you have to in sort of a miserable way because it's still something that you love, but it's just not going to be the best stuff if it's not coming from sort of a genuine want of like, oh, no, I have a great idea. I want to do this. Now it's like, oh, all these arbitrary reasons are the reasons why I'm in front of the computer or sitting with my guitar trying to write something, you know? Well, and I guess that the uh, one of the true measures of, I guess, a pro or or of a great artist in this day and age is someone who can, who has, I mean, I think those feelings are natural actually, because I've had them too, and lots of people I know have had them. Um, but I think the measure of a real pro is the person who can put those feelings aside and then just go kick ass. But I think also there, there comes a point where you need to realize that maybe now is not the best time to be trying to make music just because you you kind of do have a responsibility to put out something great and working all the time does not necessarily equal that something great will come out so absolutely 
Absolutely. That's 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 the important. I th- so this guilt that you're talking about, it's irrational because oh, completely, completely irrational. Because really, your responsibility is not to be working 16 hours a day every single day. Your responsibility is to put out great stuff, and by having that guilt and by working 16 hours a day, that doesn't necessarily equal putting out great stuff. So. That's why it's kind of irrational because one does not equal the other. It's logic versus emotions, man. They're battling yeah. <laughs> all day in there, you know. <laughs> Who knows who's gonna win? Yeah, exactly. But the thing is, you can we can say that it's irrational all day, but the feelings are feelings are feelings. By virtue of being irrational, you know, it's uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it, you're not gonna ever rationalize it out of your head. So you know, it's just kind of there, and you just learn how to deal with it. Anyways, it's it's sounding like it's like a huge problem or something. It's not. I'm not even complaining, but it's just it's just some insight into like what I guarantee you, 99 percent musicians if not a hundred percent of like sort of pro musicians who are in the system if you will deal with this to some degree and it might not be something that people are entirely aware of because it's easy to look at the the happy side of things you know but uh you just learn to deal with it really there's something about you though that i've noticed even going back to our first interactions uh before we knew each other on the ultimate uh metal forum oh yeah (laughs) yeah uh, Those something days. that's like sort of I would I would almost say uh, you know the part of your DNA or something is that you're extremely humble and you're also extremely inquisitive of of what's true and what's good and I think those are the important ingredients um, that make up uh, successful people and I think you know not only with your band is that important it's it's important in in business and and everything that you're involved in and i just admire that and i i think that uh our listeners can benefit from me pointing that out knowing that you know you can have a little bit of an ego uh and and i'm not saying you have an ego i mean people can have an ego but still be humble and i think you manage that or balance that in a really really admirable way thanks man i mean i don't I don't even think that I'm humble. I think I'm just sort of realistic and grounded. For example, if I if I genuinely thought I was sick, I wouldn't be afraid to tell people that because it would be a fact, you know? And I don't think that there would be anything wrong with that either because you'd just be speaking factually. And if you kind of, if you were like, Uh, falsely humble about it, then that's kind of condescending in my opinion, you know? So I'm not so much into that. It's just more that that's genuinely how I feel about myself. When I say, like, I don't think I'm that great, it's not me being humble. It's me being like, you know, I just, I have seen what's out there. Thank you, YouTube. Thank you, Internet. And, and like, I'm very well aware of the fact that I'm really not that great. What I seem to be doing (laughs) seems to be, yeah, it seems to be resonating with people, and that's great. But again, because because I don't feel genuinely that, like that great about what I do in the grand scheme of things. It's like, I can't think that I'm the shit. Like, I'll never think that because there's just so much more talent out there. So I just think it's being realistic and being grounded. If ever that changes, if ever like I hit my head and I become like, you know, the best guitarist or something, I won't be afraid to tell people that I'm good because it'll be true. But until that point in time, I'm. why would I say that? Because I'm not, you know, I know what my weaknesses are. I know where I have to, to work on stuff in pretty much every aspect. So I'm just going to focus on that. And I think I've tried to surround myself with people who are sort of grounded in the same way because it leads to a a healthy environment and as you said joey it's like it's it's something that i've recognized in in successful people like they do behave a certain way they do look at life a certain way they look at opportunities a certain way and if you're overly egotistical sometimes it sort, sort of can cloud your perspective and judgment in those situations in a way that'll work against you. So I think that's what I've sort of taken away from that. Well, yeah, if uh, if you're overly clouded by the ego or by the intoxicating smell of your own your own made up badassery, um, it can it can it can uh, it can really I guess muddy the waters when determining what's a realistic opportunity to jump on what's worth the risk what's not worth the risk what can you actually pull off what can you not pull off how should you proceed like you need to have a clear head to make these decisions because it's a tough world out there absolutely you cannot let yourself get clouded by dumb things like 
pride and ego. No. It, just, just think back to Pulp Fiction, where uh, he uh, he tells Bruce Willis to to go down in the uh, in the fight, mm-hmm. and he says that um, he's going to feel pride stinging him, and to just ignore that shit. And uh, I totally think about that scene a lot when I feel like my pride is getting in the way of my decision making. Right. By not going down in the fight in that scene in Pulp Fiction, he basically had the mob after him trying to kill him, whereas if he had just ignored his pride, uh, he would have walked off a millionaire. Yeah, that's a good um, point. That's a good point. I never I never looked at that scene quite that way, but that's actually a really good point. Yeah, you got to put your pride aside. Now, another thing that you said that I keyed in on is um, about how it's not about being humble. It's about being realistic. You know what's out there. I've always felt the same way when people compliment my playing or whatever. It's like, yeah, but Jeff Loomis. Or, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's like, cool. I know you like, guys understand because you guys have worked with like insane musicians too. And it's like, well, you know, I'm aware of what's out there. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you can't fool me with yeah. your compliments, dude. Like, <laughs> like I, appreciate, I, I appreciate the sentiment, but I'm not going to agree with you. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's not it's not even humility, it's just being honest. Like, yeah. It's like it's like eight is more than two. <laughs> it's not <laughs> it's just that's just the fact, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. And Jeff Loomis is better at guitar than I am. That's a that's a fact. <laughs> that's not that's not me being humble, that's me just being realistic. Yeah, exactly. And if I was better than him, I would be okay to say it nicely but i will never be better than him right so and i'm okay with that too (laughs) yeah that's 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 kind of where i'm at as well it's like it's all right that i'm not you know like that's that's the thing it's like you enter this weird dynamic all of a sudden where it's all about just sort of like sentiments that aren't actually saying anything it's just wasted breath and energy whereas really what it's about is like no I, i know where i'm at and I'm okay with that, you know, and that's knowing where I'm at allows me to be okay with that and allows me to sort of work on myself in a realistic manner, in a reasonable manner, rather than thinking that I'm better than I am and being like, well, wh- why, why is this not happening? Why am I not able to do, it? you know, it's like, you're, you're just, that's a disservice to yourself, really. I completely agree. So I have something that I've wanted to ask you for years. Ask and away. so I'm going to ask now, now's the opportunity. So... When you guys got signed, you basically did what I thought was the dream, my dream. Because um, a little bit of background was when I went to music school, I basically failed because I never went to class. And I just studied, <laughs> I just studied guitar in my room the whole time and music business. And I learned about how the industry works instead of going to class. And it seems to have worked out. But like, so in all my studies, what I came to was that the the smartest way to get signed would be to not sign worldwide deals, but to do distribution deals for different territories and right. all that, the way you guys did it. And I always wanted to do that, but my band never got the clout to be able to pull that off, to be able to negotiate that. And so when I finally, when I saw that you guys did that back, back then in what, 2009 or eight or whatever that was, yeah, I I was like, wow, they, they actually did this. This is like, this is like, if I was to write a book about how people should approach getting signed in the new era of the music industry, this would be the way to do it. And I can't believe that a band in our genre actually pulled this off. And I've always wanted to tell you that I really respect that you pulled it off and I want to hear more about it. Okay. Yeah, sure. I'm glad I'm, you know, that's something that we, we haven't really talked too much about, so I'll be happy to, to tell you all about it. Um, so yeah, I mean that deal. That deal was very different. And I'll, I'll start this off by saying that that deal was a deal that pretty much every label, like we knew exactly what we wanted. That was that was the first part. Is we knew exactly what we wanted, and we went to these labels, and you know, well, they came to us. We had labels coming to us, so we're like, hey, why should we sign with you? 
what's so great about you? Which is, first of all, that's the first thing I always tell someone. It's like, don't go like begging for a record deal. Wait for them to come to you. Go build your build your name. And then when they're coming, knocking down, then you get to ask that wonderful question. Hey, well, what's so great about you? Why should I go with you guys instead of these other guys? Like, did you actually you, say it in those words? Well, I mean, you you, you want to be polite, you know, but yeah, pretty, <laughs> but that's a sentiment. That's a sentiment. It's like, so why do you believe that we should go with you? You know, as opposed to, oh, please, please, will you sign my band? You know, which is the attitude like, here's a demo, you know, check us out. This is blah, blah, blah. It's like we had labels coming to us being like, hey, so you guys want to you guys want to go pro? You guys want to join the big boys? But we knew exactly what we wanted. And when we told them that every label was like, there's no way you're going to get that deal. There's absolutely no way you're not going to get that from <laughs> us. And no other label is going to ever give you that deal. And then our answer was like, all right, fine. <laughs> so there was like probably two or three years of that of you know labels coming to us like not every label but like all the ones that would sort of be appropriate for us everything from like local labels to big labels like roadrunner and, and uh you know and sumeria Wait, just let, let me stop you right there do you realize how like crazy that is though because how many bands have you seen unsigned bands who like are like nope Nope, to labels, and then that's it. Never get another opportunity. Well, yeah, but at the same time, you know, okay, so we were lucky because we asked a lot of questions. I asked everyone in the industry. I, I remember all our friends, I remember asking BT Bam about their, their deal, and they were like, yeah, it was, we were 18 when we signed. It was garbage. Don't sign to victory. Uh, you know, common knowledge now, but like, you know, th that was that was really good to know. Uh, victory definitely tried to tried to court us <laughs> but but obviously they never would have given us what uh, we wanted and uh you know we 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 asked all sorts of all sorts of people for advice anyone who was in the industry we asked for advice and that's how we kind of formed what it is uh, we were after and what it came down to me was this we were at a transitional time in the industry before that point in time, records were extremely expensive to make, right? So yeah. your 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 record deal with a marketing budget, I mean, you'd be looking maybe at a hundred grand all the way to a million, right? Mm -hmm. You try to get that money from a bank, they're gonna laugh at you. There's no way. You know, even pre two thousand seven, there's no way they're gonna give that money to a, a musician. So really, record labels were just banks. And they were taking your masters as collateral. So that's why that deal made sense. And you'd get like, you know, piss poor royalty, like, you know, at best you'd be getting what, like 14%, you know, and they would take, they would take your record sales. And depending on the deal, like as at that point in time with downloading, they were starting to do like what were called 360 deals, which was their, their clever way of, I love businessmen because they're, they're so good at like spinning like a shitty deal into seeming like it's a, a great thing but the 360 <laughs> deal came around and uh and that basically meant that like they would take a share of everything you made but the way that they would pitch it it was so great they would say like well we're gonna enter a partnership you know so so it's a it's a profit and risk share you know but really what it means is they don't have to put nearly as much money into your band because like it doesn't cost as much to make records anymore and they get to take 50% of whatever you make, you know, or, or whatever percentage was negotiated of whatever you make out of your merch, out of everything, which used to be untouched because CD sales used to cover that. Now people are stopping, you know, people weren't buying as much CDs. So they're like, well, we, we got to make money from somewhere. Their business models couldn't be supported off of CD sales anymore. So they got clever. Bands were doing the 360 deals. We knew to stay the fuck away from those. I can swear, right? Yeah. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. You can fucking say whatever you okay. goddamn want. All right, great, great. Well, that'll be my only fuck of the... Oh, fuck. <laughs> fuck, goddammit. <laughs> fuck, fuck. All right, All right anyways. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that was... Uh, that that was a deal we knew to stay away from because you know uh, once we understood how it operated we're like yeah that's that's a rotten deal and so basically I was going to these labels and I was just trying to approach it from a pragmatic angle I was like well look like you don't need to give us much advance money in fact you don't need to give us any advance money like we're gonna deliver something that you can literally just put out you know. Why would we give you the masters? Why would you own the masters? I understand if you're giving us a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar loan, why you want the masters? But now you're all we're asking is it's a low risk thing on your end. All you have to do is just put this out and you make money, you know, and and that's what sort of changed the conversation a little bit. It was because we were doing everything ourselves, and because it was such a low risk venture, and 
a lot of these companies were on the fence. Like I remember Monty Connor was on the fence and Monty didn't really get what we were doing. Uh, he was at Roadrunner or was yeah. at Roadrunner back then for, for those who don't know. But he was saying, he was saying, look, like, you know, I don't get your guys' music. Like, I really don't see what all the fuss is about, but I got a bunch of people in my office that say I'd be crazy <laughs> if I didn't sign you guys. I love uh, his honesty. <laughs> yeah, no, I did too. I was so thankful for it. I was really, I found it so refreshing. And I, I actually told him, I was like, yo, yo, dude, thank you for your honesty, first and foremost. Honestly, we probably would want to work with a label that is stoked on what we're doing. <laughs> but like, thank you for not wasting our time. Like, that really, that really meant a lot. And, and that's why I always liked, that's why I always liked Monty because I knew that like he would be a no bullshit kind of, I, I could tell he was just a no bullshit music fan, you know? You know what he told me about the first Doth record, the unreleased one? I oh. mean the self-released one? Oh, what he When say? he heard it, he said, you should take this record and bury it so deep so that no one could ever find it, <laughs> even if, even if a flood takes place. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's, that's honesty. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That sucks. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, I I thought it was hilarious, but that is that is funny. Well, I mean, you know, it's that same sort of brutal honesty. He was like, yeah, I don't get you guys. I don't see why the I don't see why you guys are going to be a thing. Like it's it's not my thing. But but everyone in my office says like like that I should look at you. So that's why we're talking. And um, he also didn't want to give me the kind of deal that we wanted. And the good thing about Sumerian was that th back then, you know. They were back then. Sumerian's a force now, but like back then, when other labels like, well, who else, you know, do you have looking? If I brought up Sumerian, they're like, who, you know? <laughs> and that was the beauty of it. Was Sumerian was just starting, you know? And Ash, as a result, was willing. Already, he was offering a very competitive deal because he wanted to do the three hundred and sixty deal, but he wanted to do fifty percent royalties, which was a lot better. But we were like, yeah, you can't touch the other stuff we don't want a 360 deal and we were saying look like you're great in the states what can you do for us in europe and canada like you have nothing there you know we really should just go with labels that specialize in those territories they'll push for us and you know there's a lot of back and forth over, over years and then finally he was like all right what's it going to take for us to to sign you and i told him i was like you know this is what it's going to take and he's like all right all right, we'll make it work. So it was just knowing what we wanted, being patient, talking to other labels. And here's the funny thing. Here's the funny thing. Is the second that that Ash accepted our deal, I, I think a bunch of the other labels, but definitely Roadrunner was like, oh shit, did we just fuck up? <laughs> like, because, because Monty was then like, shit, like, I guess someone would give them that deal. And it might as well have been up us. Now we had already signed for... Um, for uh, for Canada would distort at that point in time, but basically Monty came back and was like, "Look, let's scoop you up for basically every other territory," and since Roadrunner was such a force, it made sense. They had their own offices in, you know, they have their Australian office or European office and all that. So they could specialize in those territories in a way that smaller labels like Sumerian couldn't. So that worked out pretty well in the end. And although we didn't end up working with Monty himself, uh, he did facilitate that, that deal. And, you know, we're really thankful for that. So he's been really good to us, despite the, the fact that we never directly worked with him, you know? Um, but yeah, that's that's how that's how that deal sort of came about. It's just patience and knowing what you want and being able to say no. Man, that takes some balls to be able to say no to that level of uh, offer. Yes and no. I, I, I think I think the thing is that like we also started out after the transition. I think the reason that this time was a bit difficult for bands was because they went from bands and labels. Let's just say the like most of the music industry on that side of things was they were very successful doing something and having a business model that worked out just fine. And then one day it doesn't for no reason, basically for a really dumb reason. And what everyone really wants is for it to bounce back and it's not bouncing back. It's just getting worse. We entered in on the side of like, Hey, well, we have no delusions about this. There's no money in this industry. Let's just do this for the love. So if we're doing it for the love, we're going to do it right. We're not going to be sort of tempted by money and fame and all this stuff. Like for God's sakes, we're playing like progressive metal. Like 
you know how much money is there in this anyways so if we're gonna do a deal let's do it right let's 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 not compromise on that let's get the thing that we want and if we don't get it we'll just wait around and just keep on keeping on you know and and just see what happens i guess all right that makes perfect sense the way you explain it i guess it takes it takes someone who actually understands reality for what it is back to what we were saying earlier about it's not humility it's just being realistic and understanding like we right. were talking about this is why we were playing. asking this is why yeah. we were asking people for advice look we didn't understand the climate but we understood that we didn't understand the climate and that the climate seems to be changing every six months to a year so it's like all the books written about the industry were irrelevant all the information all the experts were wrong so we're like well why don't we ask bands who are in it like what sucks right now what do you wish you had done differently and we made sure that our deal reflected that you know and i'll say you know it's pretty amazing that we got the deal that we did in hindsight but it was just because we had a label that was starting out and that really wanted us that saw the potential of grabbing us and was willing to to sort of give up a lot of what they originally wanted to have in order to have us they they did the long play on that one and i'd say that worked out pretty well for both of us now you realize that this type of thinking is not common among musicians like to that's some that's some innate business sense that uh you just don't find every day in in our community do do you have any any idea where you got those instincts from? Yeah, I'm, my dad's an economist. So. Oh, there you go. Yeah. And we're Jewish. Stereo- can stereotypes come into this at all? No. <laughs> I mean, it's like, you know, money's been always, it's always been something that uh, I guess I've, I've always been aware of, of money. I've always tried to not take it for granted. I've always tried to understand I don't know. It's just the business side. I think it's fascinating to me. I think the business side is fascinating to me. And I think I've always been aware. Like, my parents were not the kind of people to spend money frivolously. They were very, very sort of, my dad especially, very calculated. My dad can stretch a dollar, like, further than just about anyone that I know. So, you know, when, look, this this all started, by the way, you know, my dad, my dad went... My dad's like that story of like you work hard, you get a you know you get a good life. Like you know, went to London School of Economics and then grad school at Harvard. And like it's just been successful because he works hard, right? Mm-hmm. Try telling that guy, hey dad, so I'm dropping out of college because I want to do music. You know, <laughs> like now he was supportive because he's like you know like like you should do what you want to do, but he was like, look, like it's a tough industry. You know, most people don't make it. Now you should try it. But you need to work hard. I don't want you to think that this is some excuse to just sit around and be lazy and play video games all day, you know? Like, you need to actually do it. And he was like, look, we'll let you move back home. You'll pay us a very reduced rate of rent. And you'll work full time. And and if you do that, we'll let you live at home for cheap. And in your free time, you can work on music. And that was the deal. So there was always this sense of, like, don't take any of this for granted and, like, really make it count. And then, I guess, you know, just being aware of the business side and that what I'm entering is a a business. You know, like, it's fun, but it is still a business and you should give it that level of respect. And, And it's like, you know, do you want this to be, like, this fun thing that you do with your friends on the weekend? Or do you want this to be, like, the real deal? Because that's going to change your attitude. That's going to change how you approach this and every decision that you make. And that's what we decided early on, is that we were going to run this like a business and treat it with that level of respect. It's interesting to me that you say that you refer to it as respect, because I completely agree. Is respect the vessel, basically. Respect, if you treat it with that level of respect, you will make better decisions, in my opinion. Absolutely. And you won't do the frivolous things and the dumb things that, well, hopefully you won't do the, the dumb and frivolous things that bands and artists do that basically shoot themselves in the foot over. I, I just, I think that that's fascinating. It's so uncommon for musicians to go in with that type of thinking. You know, something maybe you could elaborate on. You know how a lot of people, like, how do I say this? There, It's a cliche term to say your band is a business, but it's true. Your band is a business. But it's one of those things like in recording when we say just use your ears. And it's like, okay, just use your ears. But what does that even mean? Just use your ears. Because <laughs> if, if your ears aren't developed, just use your ears doesn't really mean much because 
you can't even hear what you're supposed to hear, right? Like right, if you don't right. if you can't spot what 8.5k is up a dB, then using your ears isn't going to help you to hear 8.5 up a dB. So right. when we say treat your band like a business, okay? But what does that actually mean? Well, you know, it's interesting because I've been giving I I feel like in the later years, I've been being sort of a dose of real talk with people, whether it's like, you know, at clinics or VIP or wherever, whatever opportunities I get. But I don't mind being honest about this kind of stuff. And I, I feel like it's probably needed, like, because it's not what people want to hear, but it's sometimes what they need to hear. What I'd say is that if treat your band like a business doesn't mean anything to you or doesn't translate into something that seems to benefit you you probably don't have it in the same way that if use your ears when you're mixing doesn't seem to like you know tr if you can't trust your ears or if when you trust your ears it doesn't yield a better result maybe it's not the right thing for you and that's a truth it, like not everyone is cut out for everything you know like guess what i suck at most things in life so <laughs> there's most things if you if you gave me that generic advice that works for most people like oh just do that you know you know just uh you know just follow through when you hit the ball you know like that shit like means <laughs> means nothing to me like <laughs> but, <follow> but yeah <laughs> like yeah that's 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 just gibberish it's like I, I feel like that's what i'm doing but it's making things worse if that's the case then maybe it's not for you you know and 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 that has to be okay too. It's not everyone will succeed in these in these um, in their various fields. It's important to find something that sort of does work for you. And that's not to say that you can't learn. And that's not to say that people who have a, a innate sense of it can't hone it further. Because I'm definitely no expert on any of this stuff. But I have noticed that I had a tendency towards it, and I have associated myself and the band members have a tendency for it and guess what that's a great thing to have it's a great resource to have when everyone in your band really gets it and it, it skips so many arguments because everyone's on the same page about that kind of stuff they understand that the band needs to be run a certain way and they will give the band a certain amount of respect in that sense because that's a very very important thing to everybody yeah you've got some smart dudes in your band and that's really really remarkable by the way and you're just you know coming from my production background it's not normal it's just not normal, dude. Uh, to find a to find a band where there's that many smart people, who uh, not just smart, but like that many entrepreneurs in a band. Um, normally, in a band, the, and I'm talking about successful bands, there's the one guy, right? right. The one right. guy who's like the visionary, and then maybe the one guy who's like technically really good, and then the three guys that are just good looking or you right. know cool, <laughs> cool, cool enough. You know, no, I mean, and I'm not talking shit. It's just the way it is. It's not normal to have a bunch of like alpha entrepreneur types that are really cool and really get it and really intelligent all in a, in a band. And the results speak for themselves. And I think that that's, uh, you know, that leads me to one of the other things I want to talk to you about, which is a lot of your side ventures like, like GGD or Horizon. Like, I think that it's... Right. Uh, this is what you guys are doing first of all i think it was a great example of like like i said earlier like the way you guys signed your deal was if i was to write a book about how people should approach getting signed in the new age i would have a, a chapter devoted to you guys and i've thought that for years now and wow. um Thanks, and then man. also <laughs> if i was going to write a chapter about how musicians should develop alternate revenue streams in lieu of record sales not being what they used to be i would write a chapter on you guys so basically i would write a book about you so guys. basically I, I should get some royalties on this book is what you're saying yeah right? yeah exactly <laughs> well that is if i write the book yes yes hey, you should write yeah, that we'll, book we'll, 
<laughs> All right. Yeah, that's fine. We'll do a, we'll do a three sixty deal with the boat. Yeah, we we'll do a three sixty. But <laughs> but, it, but like but for real, it's. Uh, I remember when I again when I was going to school, they told us that you should develop multiple revenue streams. But what they meant was royalties, T-shirts, and publishing. Right. They didn't mean what you guys are doing, obviously, because a lot of this stuff didn't exist yet. They didn't mean make your own pedal company make your own drum sample company and all these things that you guys do um so i wanted i wanted to talk a little bit more about that first i want to talk a little bit about the individual side ventures that you guys do but then also what uh what brought that about is that just an innate thing again like you guys are just a bunch of entrepreneurs because like for instance people who might not be aware matt your drummer like he, he did band happy years right, ago right like, right this is like this is this is what you guys do you guys make yeah. businesses yeah well i mean you know the thing is so so matt basically joined the band when we sort of became a real touring band right and mm -hmm. I think having two Matt, Matt and I are very much the entrepreneurs, you know, I'd say the other guys sort of picked it up from being surrounded by strong personalities. Like Matt and I are pretty strong personalities in the van. So, you know, the other guys sort of picked up and, and they and, and they had a knack for it. But I guess they just never really had been pushed into that. But then they realized, oh, wait, you can you can do this kind of stuff. So everyone's kind of become very entrepreneurial as a result. And it's become like a healthy place to discuss that kind of stuff and to, to follow that kind of stuff. And it's also interesting because, you know, you mentioned Band Happy, but Band Happy failed, you know, but was a, was so such an important lesson from Matt. And it also shows you, you know, it's like that. <laughs> the, the the cliche I hate those goddamn motivational poster things but like you know it's it's <laughs> it's what it's that sentiment of like yeah if, you know if it fails so what you know you learn something move on and dentist and, office posters right right <laughs> so exactly it's like but but it, but it is really that I mean like we don't we don't have any posters for it but that's literally what happened you know Matt Matt was bummed out about it and then just bounced right right back and just got into new things and those things have been successful it's just. You know, it's and that's the kind of mentality. It's like, well, what's the worst that can happen? You'll fail, and and you know, it, then you just do the the next thing. I just did a podcast where I told, I answered a question about how do I get over my fear of submitting things, and I just and my answer is just fuck it, because yeah, if you submit something and people hate it. Uh, a mix or whatever or your business venture or you submit your band to get signed and you don't get the deal or you don't get the mix or your business fails or whatever fuck it who cares what's the worst you're not gonna die it sucks and you and yeah you're you're you just do the next thing just focus exactly. on the next thing like it just means that that didn't work it doesn't mean that you suck it means that 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 idea didn't work and it, it's not even that the idea sucked necessarily it might just not have been delivered properly who knows learn from why it didn't work basically is the point and do the next thing and you know that's what we do that that's that's what all, what all of us do but i think this idea that you know when you're when you when you're an entrepreneur you can make your business about whatever you want so you make it about things you care about it's kind of sweet so us being musicians and and having this entrepreneurial spirit means that we're going to be involved in the music industry because it's things that we genuinely care about and if periphery's ever been a lesson for anything it's like do things you genuinely give a shit about you know like periphery has always been a, a way of uh, it's just a, a vessel for self-expression so and no matter who's come in and tried to pollute that with you know talk of like being a radio band or fame or money or whatever it's very easy to tell those people to fuck off because we genuinely don't have any interest in that and especially as we transition to this point you know periphery's never made a lot of money and even as it stands doesn't make a lot of money like everyone in the band makes a pretty good living but but we do it outside of the band maybe because of the band but not directly as a result of the band's income the band's income is very limited so that gives us this freedom to enjoy the band and make it just about the music make it just about what we want and we'll never be tempted by these these things that could sort of corrupt it well, that also extends to these businesses. These are all passion projects. They all started out as just things that were like, this is something cool. This is something that we like. And in starting something that's a passion project, it's very easy to 
not let it get corrupted, you know? And I think that that's where a lot of the problems come up is when, you know, you have a good idea, but then you get a taste of money or fame or whatever. And then you sort of compromise that idea because you want a bit of that. It's like, I've started to realize that if you genuinely have something that's good and something that you're passionate about, that that alone can allow it to exist and and be good enough. And if you handle the business side in a smart fashion, you shouldn't have to sell your soul to make it work. I think that that's, that's very, very wise. So more specifically then, what needs were you trying to fulfill, I guess, by doing these projects? Like why Horizon? Okay, so like Horizon was just because I love pedals. I, <laughs> I have so many pedals. I have so many pedals, and I can't, my, my deal with Proton sort of ran its course. And I was actually talking to my dad about it, and I was like, yeah, you know, I'm having trouble finding another company that's going to be a good fit. My dad was like, why don't you just start your own? And I was like, come on, Dad. I can't just start a pedal company, you know? Yes, you can. And and, and that it's so funny, because, like, he was, he was totally right. But, like, of course, my first reaction to my dad's going to be like, no, Dad, come on, shut up, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly how I reacted to my friend telling me to make a plug-in company. I was like, you right. can't just start a plug-in company. You can't just company. do that. And, then, and then, you, <laughs> then you mull it over for a few days, and you're like, wait, but maybe I can, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then, and then the idea becomes very attractive. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I guess it's just that initial inertia to change but then like once once it catches then you get the momentum of that and it's like okay no this is this is what i want to do and i i I, you know luckily just uh being in the industry and having a lot of friends and contacts like i realized that i had uh i had some good contacts um so my buddies uh maytab and uh brian who uh do uh wired guitarist and string drop and uh you know just generally brilliant brilliant marketing guys like i've always just talked to them over the years about marketing stuff because i knew they were like real geniuses with that i was like hey so i'm I'm thinking about doing this like you think this is a good call is this anything that maybe you'd be interested in they're like and they're like well, let's think about it and they were like yeah you know what this could be worth looking at you know and we just kind of started talking and it was uh it was kind of something that the more we talked about it, the more excited we got about it. And that's that's that sign. That's how you know. And it's it's the same thing with like a band or business, a song or whatever. It's like you, you kind of get this like gut feeling after a certain point when you're on to something that you're like, yeah, I think I think we're on to something here, you know? And that's what we were getting there. And so then eventually it was just like this is something that we're all really excited about. Like let's let's get this going, you know? And uh, and that's that's what started the ball rolling on that. Something like uh, like GGD, for example. Like, so we have our drum sample company. You know, we'd been using tune tracks since basically since I started recording. You know, and it was just it was just like, hey, well, guys, I, I think we have the resources to do one of our own. You know, and it wasn't to try to be competitive or anything. It was literally just for fun. It was just like, wouldn't it be sweet to have our own drum samples? Like, wouldn't it be sweet to have Matt's playing in Matt's kit? Like I'm already programming stuff for Matt in his style. Like would like I'd love to have his samples. I think his drums sound great. I think Nolly makes his drums sound great. Like if I could have that on my computer, I would be so stoked. And if we have it, we could probably try to sell it too, you know? And that's how that started. But these were just literally just passion projects. I think they came from the right place for me because they were just things that I wanted. <laughs> so we made them and and that's that's kind of a good angle to start from in my opinion let me uh just tell our listeners um those of you who are subscribed to nail the mix you get twenty dollars off get good drums in our bonuses section they were nice enough to provide a code just for you guys so if you're subscribed go to the bonuses and uh look up the get good drums bonus and get those drums because they sound great so now back to our regularly scheduled programming um so thanks, thanks wh- for the plug <laughs> yeah no problem i mean happy to do it the uh what i thought was interesting because i was watching the product videos about the horizon pedals and um i thought that it was very very smart to do something pedal wise that actually addresses modern issues like extended range guitars low tunings and digital amps like the Kemper for instance Um, because 
we do all love our tube screamers, but they're not designed for modern music. And it, I think it's so cool that you guys took the something that's classic that people seems like people will always love. People will always love overdrives, but you tweaked them in a way that actually is relevant in 2017. Yeah, I mean that was that. This is like kind of a general thing, a general trend that I've noticed is. Um, Oftentimes, new sounds or new trends in this industry, and I'm sure you guys have noticed the same thing, is usually from sort of appropriating uh, some old technology or technique or whatever and sort of applying it in a different context than what you would expect. It's like, oh, but did you know if you try this pedal in front of it, you know, you get this other sound, and it's like, that's great, and it's really cool, but that's an accident. That's not on purpose. So then it's looking at like, okay, so what about this accident is working to my advantage? And then if that's the case, then what do I wish we could tweak about it? Like, for example, the high pass filter and low pass filter on a tube screamer are what create the sort of tightness and smoothness that you get when you put it in front of a high gain amp. It was never intended to be used like that, but but that's what it works really well for. And the high pass filter is the most noticeable effect so it was like well what if we had a variable high pass filter because you know sometimes people complain about there not being enough low end sometimes too much and it's definitely down to the amp and the guitar it's definitely down to your setup so there's no one solution that works for everything so why don't we just make it variable and then you can adjust it like depending on your rig and that seemed like a good idea and it seemed like also the next thing is that anyone who was doing that because of the added noise in that setup would always be putting a gate of some kind afterwards so it was like well why not just put that on the pedal and all this stuff was also like sort of crowdsourced like one thing we wanted to do was to get people's feedback on this because one thing that me and my partners at horizon were discussing was like it's almost like a guessing game. We realize, like, oh, well, what should we put out? Well, what do people want? It's like, well, I think they want this. It's like, well, how about instead of thinking what they want, why don't, why don't, we, we, just ask? Ask? Why don't we just ask them what they want, you know? And do we do that all the time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because it's like, it's like, why, why figure out, especially when we have a great tool like the internet. I understand why before, you know, you didn't have access to people, but now we have access to people. And people like being have access to. People like answering questions. People like being involved with community stuff. If there's anything that we've learned with Periphery, it's that, you know, being very close with your fan base is only a good thing. It's only a good thing. At least for us, it's it's been. So so we're like, well, why don't we take that same attitude and let's see let's see what these guys come up with pedals and they're all they're obviously you know the first question we get is like you know like well how how do you how are you sure you won't end up with something crappy you know and it's like yeah okay <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna filter this to, to some degree it's not gonna be like that uh mountain dew campaign where they named the drink uh Hitler wasn't so bad because it was like because <laughs> it was like Is an that open, what one yeah, yeah yeah because it was just like input whatever name and vote on it that's a lesson that you learn so we are filtering this you're not gonna you're not gonna end up with that pedal but but you know there are but there are some really creative ideas there's some really creative ideas and some really good feedback that we got um, it was sort of a, a, a shorter process with this first pedal the the precision drive that we put out but you know we're already starting to pull for even what direction we. Go go in for the for the new one and the the response that we got was was just insane i mean even the the, the pre-sales on the pedal have been in like way beyond what we expected so it shows that people want to be involved and it shows that there is something there to to be explored and i'm actually just kind of excited because i'm not entirely sure what we're going to put out but it's going to be kind of up to the community it's going to be you know someone was saying like oh is, you know is that your signature pedal i was like actually it's your signature pedal you you guys are the ones that are designing this you know we're going to we're going to put it together we're going to filter it so that it it's it's a good idea on a working pedal and we're going to make sure that it's top quality but it's your ideas that are going to be the basis of what will form this new pedal. Such a smart idea, actually responding to the needs and wants of the marketplace in real time. Yeah, I mean, if, if you think about it, it's like, w wouldn't you want to be giving people what they want, you know, rather than having to guess and hope, you know? Like I said, man, that, the, we do that all the time over at Nail the Mix and your yeah. academy. Yeah, we, yeah. Uh, I mean, since we do education, we always balance it with... Uh, 
what they want to know versus what we know that they need to know. So, like, for instance, on our URM enhanced level, which is above Nail the Mix, we have a set of lo- a, a video library called Fast Tracks. They're like courses, like two or three hour long courses of very specific things like gain staging or how to actually hear compression, things like that. And we actually, we know that they wanted to get some of these topics in there, but we make the order that you go in at the beginning required so that it's required that you go through the gain staging one. It's required that you go through the mix prep one as prerequisites because gain staging and mix prep are two of the most important things that you could do to mix properly but those are the two things that people will skip because they'll want to get right to compression right and uh and the fun stuff so we'll we'll source the crowd to find out what it is that they want to learn and then we'll like you did we'll filter it and uh and then we'll will superimpose that or will combine that with what we know that they need to know in order to be able to actually utilize what they want to know. Yeah, and I think that's really smart. That's like how you can sort of have your cake and eat it too with with that whole way of delivering the the lessons, you know, and the content. I think that's really smart. It works great, man, because uh, they actually... They actually are getting better, and uh, they are enjoying it at the same time. So, by the way, thanks for uh, focusing on gain staging and and mix prep because those are probably the two most boring, annoying to learn about subjects that really don't have any immediate. You know, there's no instant gratification from that, but it's probably like the best the most important skills you could learn <laughs> like to, to tell you the truth like dude it's crucial <laughs> it's probably the especially if they're sending stuff off to uh, to be mixed after the fact like god like that that saves everyone a lot of time so you're you're building the next generation of uh, of engineers that'll make sure that mixes sound better and that people won't be as annoyed with the the mixes they get <laughs> well that's that's okay well the thing is we actually want people to be able to get hired like we're we realize that not every single person who subscribes is going to have a career and that's fine yeah it's not possible it's um, not it's just but, not <laughs> but yeah no it's not but w- we do want a certain percentage of our students to actually do this for real that's the goal we want to create professional engineers out of this and one of the most hireable skills i guess that you can have is to know how to set up a session properly. Yeah, that mixers will pay you for that. That that will. It's not glamorous, but that's an that's an entry point. That's an entry point like no other. You want to get your foot in the door? Do that. It's better Man, than clean the toilets. I did. I cannot tell you how many mixes I set up for people for years and drums I edited, samples I laid, vocals I tuned. I did that shit for all the annoying busy work, but that has to be done to a certain standard or else it's fucking useless. You know, it, I think it's the same in movies too. I've heard that the best directors uh, tend to come from the editing room. Right. Like the, right. Right. It's just you're working your way up. You're working your way up, and then they're like, "Whoa, you got some skills." Oh, that's kind of sick. You know, like that's that's a hundred percent true. Or it's like in, the, in with touring. I always tell people like, "Yeah, you want you want to you want to be in a touring band." Go do merch for a band for free. You want to be on tour? That's that's how you could do. It. Oh, my band can't get tours. Yeah, well, go on tour. Just go and tech for someone for free, and then you'll be shocked how in two years you'll know everyone in the industry and everyone will know you, and you'll all of a sudden have all these opportunities. I've seen it happen. We've been we've been there for 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 uh, or we've done that for people. You know, we've seen their growth over years. It's like it's not the obvious path. It's not the glamorous path, but it fucking works. Dude, is there really a glamorous path in this? No. Anymore? No, absolutely not. absolutely not. Absolutely not. Anyone who thinks there is is just ba- you're just guaranteed disappointment. I think again, well, this goes back to being realistic, setting realistic ex- expectations and managing them because if you think that you get to be a rock star, if you think you get to, you know, if you think any of what we do is is glamorous, you know, it's like you talk about about being humble. Well, this this industry is humbling. Like 
there's no room for those egos because of how humbling this industry is. And there, you know, especially if you're doing like rock and metal and stuff like that, it's really just, it's passion stuff and there's less money in it than there ever was. So there's no glamorous way. To, there's no glamorous point of entry. There's no glamorous lifestyle. You know, you do it cause you love it. Well said. So how do you feel about answering some questions from the crowd? Cause we've got a few. Yeah. They were v- very, to- they to- were very excited. Totally. Totally. Cool. Cool. All right, so here's one from Karsten Hansack, which is, Misha, how do you approach writing MIDI instrument parts so that they sound nearly human and not like a robot playing a synth violin? Okay, well, that's good. That's good. So he's talking about the orchestral stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, it's, it, you know, it's the same as you'd program uh, drums or anything like that, just in terms of the approach. It's just being very careful with the velocities with all these sample libraries it's very tempting i'm sure you guys have seen this with drums like because the loudest velocity always sounds sort of the most impactful it's very tempting to just always go full velocity on everything i think one thing to do is actually to not start at full velocity like maybe just short of it if you're going for something intense but understanding that like you want to have some headroom to be able to use for for impacts and things like that and then the other thing is just spending the time with it. Like I hate to say it, but like like uh, speaking of of unglamorous work, so much of what I do is just boring, like editing and tweaking and experimenting, and sort of knowing what sound I'm going for. And every library is different, so sometimes you won't get the result you want, and you'll have to like combine patches. Sometimes, like for example, a, a violin legato patch. It's it sounds great on its own, in the in the mix, it's just sounding kind of synthy, and it's. it's you know, so if you layer a spiccato patch with that, for example, you can sort of get that bow change effect a little bit and it'll actually cut through. But that's just one example. And I'm getting very, very specific here, but <laughs> it's just no, spending, that's good. It's spending the time with that kind of with that kind of stuff and experimenting because there isn't any one solution. And I think a lot of people are looking for this sort of one size fits all answer. But you guys know as well as I do that, like you know, a mix is a mix. And when you change one thing, everything else changes. So what worked in that last mix will not necessarily work in this mix. And you might have to find a new solution to that. So don't just go through the same process expecting to get the same result. You might have to branch out and try different things. And don't be afraid to do that is is the point. And don't be afraid to spend some time on it because all the stuff that sounds good did not happen quickly <laughs> there was there's a guarantee you a lot of time was put into that and a lot of uh careful thought well spent time i would say was put into that so that would be my advice i echo that um none of that stuff happens easily when no. it comes to when it comes to virtual instruments um here's one from jake hankel which is misha what does your daily guitar practice regimen consist of is it scales rhythms I don't practice guitar, man. I wish I did. Um, this is getting into a deeper philosophical thing here. I think when I, I was, figured that was, I figured that you yeah, were going to say that when I when I was younger. When I was younger, I practiced and I tried to practice. I've never had the mind for practice. I've always been more of a creative. So what would happen is I'd like start trying to practice scales. I get bored out of my mind and I just start trying to write riffs. And I used to get really upset about that, but I'm starting to realize that maybe, you know, I'm not a technician. I'm really not. And I know so many people who, on on the technical side of things, are just light years ahead uh, of, of where I'm at. And that's that's okay, you know, <laughs> because that's just not what I focus on. I like to write. I like to write. But if you want to be a technician... You know, you can find all sorts of resources on YouTube, online, for free or paid, you know, to, to, to get that stuff. And, you know, being in a band with a guy like Nolly, who really is a technician and really like the, the amount of detail that he puts into his technique is insane. It's mind boggling. And that's stuff that he practices and works on. I would say take it to that level. But for me, it's it's more about the creative side, and I've started to acknowledge that and stop trying to force myself to practice because I, you know, I am working on my technique, but I just realized that I'm just never going to be that guy. I'm never going to be that guy that you're going to watch and you're going to be like, wow, I want his technique. Like it's my technique's always going to hold me back a little bit, and that's what I work on it on. So it holds me back as little as possible. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I just don't enjoy practicing, and I don't get anything out of it. The times I've forced myself to practice, it's like 
I'll get better at it for that day. And then the next day, it's like, if you don't maintain it, then, you know, then it's all gone anyways. And I was like, I didn't really get anything from that. Like, that didn't really do what I wanted it to do. But if I spend that time writing a song or writing an idea and I end up with something, I have something that I can look back at. So my pursuits now are more into the sort of abstract, like just writing and, and you know, trying to filter out what's good, what's worth working on and trying to get over my weird insecurities with music and trying to write <laughs> all that fun stuff that, that happens when you write a lot of music. But um, yeah, I haven't even been playing guitar that much. Lately, I've been getting so much pleasure from like uh, writing like orchestral mock-ups and things like that. Like That's really been tickling my fancy. So that's, that's the stuff I've been practicing, if anything. And um, you know, that I'll spend hours and hours doing without, you know, the hours will disappear. And if the hours are disappearing, then you're probably doing something that you enjoy. So, you know, that's that's kind of what I'm tending towards is things that I enjoy doing rather than things that I feel like I have to or probably should do. You'll always do a better job when we're talking about creative ventures with things that uh, that you get lost in. Yeah. As a general mantra, I'm going to share with you guys something that really seems so stupid, but but it's kind of important to me. And I will say that part of this is just because I'm fortunate en enough to be where I'm at and, you know, in sort of a comfortable place for the time being. But as, as things stand now, I've realized that I don't have to do things I don't want to do. And there's a, there's a bit of like, there's, a, I, I think, I think, I think that myself and, and you guys, <laughs> we'd consider ourselves hustlers, right? You know, like we've always yes. had to hustle. We've always had to work. We've always had to do things we don't want to do just to build towards something bigger. But I think what I've learned is also after you've gotten to a certain point, you can actually afford it your, to yourself to take a step back and do the things you want to do and not have you like basically learn to say no. Learn to say no to things. I used to get this this crippling guilt from saying no to things that I didn't want to do, that I didn't <laughs> need too. to do. I didn't need the money. I didn't need anything from it. But it was just this guilt because I was I was I came up from hustling, from saying yes to everything, working really hard, doing everything, and, and realizing now like, but that's a big battle. That was a big battle, uh, and I, I'm finally starting to get the hang of it. But it's just sometimes you just say no. Sometimes. You, you don't do the things you don't want to do if you don't have to. If there's no perceivable benefit, you don't have to do them. And and that might sound weird to some of the listeners because maybe they don't have that same complex. Maybe I'm just crazy, but it's like... I completely relate. <laughs> but yeah, so so basically just just saying saying no to things. And this is like the big picture answer of why I don't practice guitar as much anymore. <laughs> <laughs> To loop it all right back home. That's, but yeah, I'm I'm dead serious. Like that's something I think has made me a lot happier in recent times. Is just doing the things that I want to do, doing the things that make me happy, and trying to minimize having to do the things that don't make me happy. I only do them if I have to, or if it's something that leads towards something bigger or something that will make me happy. So yeah. One thing that we've started doing very heavily is delegating those things. Um, so that we can focus. I know Joey delegates like crazy. I delegate like crazy. And this is so that we can focus on the things that we're best at so that we can keep the our eye on the prize and we can keep things moving forward aggressively. Because the, the hustle is alive and well. But right. as you progress, the things that you need to focus on in order to keep growing become harder and harder and more and a higher level and they take they take you being more in tune i guess in a weird way you more in tune with the universe i guess and yeah. i don't know how to explain it no you need i know to just what you're be, saying i know what you're saying it's like you're kind of figuring it out so it's like oh yeah this is yeah. the way i was supposed to be doing stuff <laughs> yeah exactly and you can't be spending the same kind of time on the things you did before right, right. because then you'd be at the same level you were at before well there's only so many hours in the day there's only so much energy you need to focus that energy efficiently and and delegating is a way to do it but also the the side you're not mentioning that is you need to have people that you can trust you need oh, to have yeah. people well, that you it, it, delegating is useless if people won't do <laughs> if you can't trust the people because we have a great team exactly exactly I'm, I'm sure you do and like it's the same it's same that's why my band you know is, is a certain 
group of people and the companies we have are, are it's all very calculated because everyone kind of focuses on their strengths and doesn't have to focus on things they're not as great at or they don't enjoy doing, you know, and, and then everything sort of works, you know, and everyone can put their best energy towards things that are productive. And I hate practicing guitar too. Me too. That's the point. That's, <laughs> so, <laughs> that's all you need to walk away with. Is, I hate practicing. Yeah. Not going to do it. Next. Next. All right. Here's one from Brad Thomas, which is when writing for a band with three guitars, how do you usually split up the responsibility? I.e., who gets the main riff and who provides more of the ear candy? So we get that question a lot. I think, you know, what people may not fully understand is that the three guitar thing is really a live thing because when I was writing and when we were starting out, and when you have the power of a computer, <laughs> which has all the tracks that, that your imagination can muster, you can get kind of crazy. And, and I was doing a lot of stuff where there'd be a lot, a lot more than three guitar parts going on. So it was the idea that like, even with backing tracks, there'd be sort of substantial parts or parts that we wish we wouldn't have to put on a backing track. So generally, whoever writes the riff, you know, gets dibs on how they want to, you know, or what part they want. It's never been a problem. <laughs> like, it's really just never been a problem. I'm very lucky to have Mark and Jake being the kind of people that they are. Like, we write so well together. People always ask if there's, like, ego there and or if we battle. And it's like, no, there's relief when I work with them because I got two guys who've got my back who write the sickest riffs that I could never come up with but that are totally in the style that I that I'm writing, you know, or, and, and we've influenced each other. So it's just this big, big old circle jerk, basically. <laughs> and everyone, everyone's, everyone's really open to whatever. We all play rhythm parts, clean parts, lead parts, whatever. There's no, no moms are calling being like, ah, my son needs more solo time or anything like that. You know, it's just, <laughs> it's, it's just, it's just whatever. It always seems to work out really easily. So it's not something that I think about or that I think they think about either it's something that we can just trust that happen it'll work out it'll be fine but it really is just a live thing and the you know live it'll either be we're playing three completely different parts or something i like very much um is that two people will be playing one part and that will be panned so it's double tracked and then the other person will be playing whatever part that is whether it's a lead clean ambient whatever and then uh there's also unison parts, which are very cool because you almost get that quad track chorusing effect that you get. You know, it just makes it sound very sort of thick in a in a very unique way. So I really, you know, I really like having uh, those guys live to to play around with, and and it just gives us a lot of options with how we're going to approach things live. Totally. So here's one from Zalen Siganera. Uh, man, I'm so sorry. I can't pronounce your last name. This always happens, so, man. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's Siganero. I'll just go with that. We're Zaylen trying. Ciganero. We're trying. We're trying, man. <laughs> so could you go over peripheries in your monitor system for practice and stage? Sure. That would be incredible. Yeah. So we're using a... Uh, Behringer X32 rack unit, which is pretty, pretty awesome. I never thought I'd be stoked on Behringer stuff, especially like, you know, from when I was starting out, their stuff wasn't so great, but this mixer is awesome. It's, um, it's, you can control it with an iPad and it has enough sub mixes that all six of us can, uh, well now there's five, but back when there were six of us, all six of us could control, uh, our own mixes, uh, using an iPhone or an iPad or whatever. And uh, Marquides, our front of house guy, um, Alex Marquides, he could actually mix us. He, he actually did mix us for a bunch of tours off that. So it was like our all-in-one system. It was great. Uh, since then, we've been renting boards just because, you know, it sounds better and it's, it's better for him. But it, it's kind of nice that you can do that. And for like sort of fly rigs, that's, that's amazing. It's everything we need right there. So that then has to go to um, in-ear monitors, uh, which we have the Sennheiser EW300 G2, I think is what it's called. It's like basically what everyone uses. And we got those, I want to say like, God, like four years ago, maybe, maybe longer. And we're using the same ones. Like they're just super, super reliable uh, and they work great. So uh, that's what actually transmits the sound 
from our mix uh, to our ears. And then for uh, for the in ears, I think we're pretty much all using uh, 1964 ears. Or no, they're called 64 ears now. But I'm using the A6. And yeah, so basically, I have those are those are molded in ears for people who don't know. So they're also earplugs because you really should protect your ears. And given uh, how much I'm, I'm mixing, producing, and all that stuff, like I really can't afford to lose my ears. So it's uh, it'll it'll protect it'll protect your ears, and it'll also give you a very very clear sound and allow you to have a lot in your mix and. I have my own individual mix that's exactly the way that I need it with a click, you know, which we all have. We we all have a click and it's and it's actually a very detailed click. Matt Matt our drummer turned us on to that where we have it doing like uh you know the 16th note or 8th note subdivision so you really know where the beat is, but the accents are always a little different. So you can always tell exactly where the beat is it we just found that it helps smart, us play, it very helps us play smart. tight yeah he loves it like he loves that i think it helps him like kind of push and pull on the beat a bit more because he never really has to guess exactly where the beat is but um but it but it's great it's great for us it helps us lock in and then um you know everyone has complete control over how how their mix is because we're using axe effects and because most of the 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 aspects are consistent. Our, our mixes are generally consistent, but you will catch us occasionally like changing stuff on the fly, you know, on our phones or, or iPads or whatever. And it's great to have that freedom. If something's, if something's not quite right that day for whatever reason. Cool. All right. So Tyler Rodriguez is asking, what would you say are your influences on your orchestral writing? Any specific movie scores and or composers? Uh, I'd say the only composer that's been like a real influence probably like Nobuo Uematsu from the Final Fantasy series. That's other, great stuff. Uh, yeah, other, other than that, it's probably just passive stuff. I've just been kind of going head first. I, I again, I'm I'm not I'm not the read the manual guy. I'm I'm the like I'm going to go in head first and try and figure this out for myself. Uh, and I don't really know what I'm going for. I'm just kind of playing around with a lot of that stuff. So, I'm sure I have passive influences and um you know, I listened to a lot of classical music when I when I grew up. You know, but like the what I'd call the the pop classical composers like Mozart, Beethoven, Tchaikovsky, stuff like that. You know, but um, yeah, I I I I don't think I'm thinking about any of those influences other than maybe Nobuo. But that's only for certain things. If I'm trying to do something like very RPG style, you know. Other than that, it's more like having this sort of world. Actually, I'm going to expand on this a little bit because this is something right. I've wanted to to tell people why I'm into this this uh, this orchestral stuff. This is probably more of an influence. This is actually probably the influence. Back in 2002, that's when I first started recording, and it's because I had a gaming computer and I realized that it was finally powerful enough that I could record on it and you know, not have to go to a studio to get my ideas out. And with, you know, I had, I had a drum kit from hell, which I ran in reason, you know, I didn't know anything about DAWs or anything like that. I was just like, again, not reading the manual, just kind of figuring stuff out for myself and having fun. And that to me was the most inspiring thing in the world that all of a sudden I, at no cost to myself could make all this music by myself and sure it didn't sound great or whatever but it was mine and i could do it whenever i wanted i could do it in my apartment without bothering anyone because i could do it on headphones that to me was like incredible and inspired the crap out of ideas and that's why i wrote so much i'd been feeling a little bit uninspired as of late well as, as of about a year and a half ago, I want to say. I've just been feeling kind of dry on ideas. It happens, you know? We go through eb ebb and flows as creative people. But I discovered that now we were at the point where you could get very realistic orchestral mock-ups on your computer, and you didn't need, like, an insane setup. Like, you used to need... You used to have to, like, chain oh, yeah. computers <laughs> together with, like, Vienna Ensemble. But it was, like, now, like, technology had finally caught up to... And there was... It was basically the advent of SSDs allows you to stream these libraries off. So it doesn't take up a lot of RAM. It takes up CPU power, but CPUs are powerful enough that it catches up. So we're at this point where, like, all of a sudden it becomes accessible accessible and it's just it's just money it's a lot of money unfortunately but it was like that was so exciting to me it's like now an orchestra which is something that's extremely expensive extremely extremely expensive i could mock that up 
on my computer for fun whenever I want. And that was that same level of inspiration that I felt back in 2002. It was like this new world had been opened up and I knew nothing about it. I still know very little about it. I'm just trying to learn. So that's my inspiration is that I've discovered this new world for myself and I'm just trying to learn what it is for myself. And that's it. And just so uh, people understand what you mean by extremely expensive a c-rate orchestra will cost you approximately 20 grand a day yeah to uh to rent i guess and that's if you not want including to get them the studio anything. by the way <laughs> that's yeah that's just the orchestra that's just the orchestra like it's it's it, you know and considering that we recorded uh periphery three i think the entire budget just for the recording was probably under 10 grand you know it's like well just the orchestra would be like double or triple that it's it's pretty it's pretty nuts so you know yeah like it's it this is this is a great solution and what we did on periphery three which was great was we then hired a very small section of musicians to play you know what i'd programmed over certain parts and we layered it because these these sample libraries that i was using were uh, these they're they're huge huge sections so you get the sense of the size but then the realistic small sections layered over the top gave you that layer of realism and made it not sound like any particular sample library so it's kind of best of both worlds and that did not cost us very much money so that was kind of our way around that i want to shout out my friend trevor fidel who helped me do tons of string parts over the years really cool guy uh his email is trevor.fidel at gmail.com if you guys are trying to do what uh, misha's talking about i've done the same thing basically layer it up with uh you know virtual instruments and then get trevor to have like a small three or four piece put the real stuff over top of it and uh, it works so well, and he's, he's it's kind of incredible how how well it works, isn't it? Yeah, and and you know he's set up to where you can just send him your tracks and just say, here's what I want you to play, and then he also will include like a, a freestyle, right? He'll get the he works with the uh, students. Uh, I can't from can't remember the college that he works with, but he'll have the students come in, they'll play all the parts as you want them to, and then they'll also do like a little freestyle for each instrument. And sometimes those uh, freestyle parts are really cool. That's awesome. I, I actually we worked with this guy Randy Slaw who did uh, he did the periphery two just that that violin part in the beginning of Have a Blast, but we kept him in mind, you know, and he came in at the last minute on periphery three and like did such a great job in so little time because it was just kind of a last minute like hey do you think you can do this he's like oh i'm gonna try but i think he works with students as well and like he he got he did such a great job especially given that a lot of the parts that i was writing were not really conducive to being played on <laughs> on orchestral instruments you know because it's like based around guitarists and drop c <laughs> it's like you know, the, he had to find some some talent to get it done. But um, you know, th that's definitely the kind. What you're talking about, Joey, is definitely the kind of setup that uh, is sort of a cost effective way to get the best of both worlds. Yeah. Hey, here's one from Eduardo Panda Sacera, which is for the new record. As far as I remember, you used a Friedman BE100 sim in the Axe Effects. How do you approach that plexi styled amp to sound so brutal? Um. You know, I, I think that I, I have to give all the credit to the Axe Effects on that one. It might have been, I was on Quantum 1.0. That was the firmware. And the amps always change a little bit with the firmware. But I actually left one at that firmware because the, the Friedman model sounds so good. I actually have the real Friedman next to me right now. So it's kind of funny. But um, there's something about the Axe Effects where it's like, you know, it has the character of the amp, but it's sort of a hyper real version of the amp and that works really well for peripheries like this very sort of clean version of the amp and um we didn't even use a boost for that you know it was kind of interesting it was a, it was like kind of a test to ourselves because we've always used a boost in front of an amp always and even live we still do that but like for the record in that control environment we were just trying to see if we could dial the amp in and just pick really hard and you know we were using my uh my my jackson guitars and uh, those have my uh bare knuckle juggernaut pickups which are just very good they're designed so that if you pick hard they'll they'll sound very very good so i think the combination of all of that and just picking really hard 
worked well. But it, I think it's probably I, I have to give most of the credit to Fractal because they they killed it with that uh, that firmware and that version of that amp. And um, the other thing that I think a lot of people don't really realize, but I know for a fact that you guys know, is that. Um, so much of what people consider to be guitar tone is the cab or the cab oh, sim yeah. or whatever. And like, you know, like that exact patch with like any other cab w- might not work in the mix, but the cab that we were using, uh, or the cab sim, I should say that we were using is great. It's from that, um, that cab, uh, that cab pack I did with them. Um, cab pack 13 Misha mix eight. That one just was magical. Like it just sat in the mix perfectly. It worked. We didn't have to do much EQ or anything to that guitar tone. It's, I think it was like kind of cool because we, we wanted periphery three to be a bit of a, a bit more of a raw album, like less like, like I'd say like juggernaut had like a lot of sort of, it was a very processed album. It was just like, how huge can we get this to sound? And we use samples where we need to, and, you know, edit the crap out of everything. This one was a very raw album. And like a lot of the takes are very raw and the approach to the, the guitar tone was, so it's like, we were trying to see how little we could get away with. So the fact that like, the guitar tone on periphery three, I could just describe to you right now. It's a Friedman, the Friedman, uh, BE 100 amp model on there with the bright switch on everything at noon. I think gain was at six and maybe we rolled off the bass a little bit. And that's just like the cab, uh, the cab pack 13 Misha mix eight. That's it. That's a, that's periphery three guitar tone right there. Nice. Okay. Here's one from Diego Casillas, which is what was the most helpful advice you received in relation to mixing and production, what gave you the most major improvements once implemented? Oh man, I don't think there's a thing. I don't. I like. I don't. I don't think. And Nolly and I have had these like discussions that there isn't a thing. You know, it's it's all very small moves. And he, and what Nolly told me is like, you know, he's he's worked with a lot of uh, of producers and met a lot of producers that he respects and engineers that he respects and some of them have shown him you know session files and, and mixes um, of, of things that he really likes and he could actually see what was going on under the hood and he said there was n- no part where there was this like aha you know or like this moment of like oh there's this crazy thing that he's doing differently a lot of it had to do with just like how you're capturing the source tones and just small moves like little moves that like nudge it in a certain direction and there are little tricks here and there but none of them are sort of these night and day tricks that like all of a sudden like I didn't get it yesterday and I get it today so that's my answer is like there isn't there isn't something like that and if you're chasing something like that you're doing it wrong in my opinion you should be i completely agree actually yeah like i I figured you guys would agree too because you probably have come to the same conclusion that there's no there's no like secret magic happy button you know it's just it's little calculated moves and experience and it's and the most important thing as i think we all know is just your source tone like what? Like all the, the all the processing in the world doesn't count for a goddamn thing if your source tone sucks. So, get it right at the source and understand how to capture a source tone. I feel like that that right there, in my opinion, would be the answer to the question. What's the one thing that has made all the difference instantly? It's get your fucking source tones yeah, right. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. But what what that is is a long time consuming process <laughs> you know like that's something oh, yeah. that you have to figure out what works for you because again there's no one way to capture a source tone correctly and even if there is it's probably not exactly what you want and it's a disservice to yourself to resign yourself to to some system that someone else set up that was right for them what you should be doing in my opinion is finding out what works for you use their use their guy their their setup as a guideline but find out what works for you and find out what you want to do and refine your process. I've seen Nolly do this over the, you know, I'm not the mixing guy. I'm the creative guy, but I've watched Nolly obsess over this for years. Like, I, you know, now everyone sees like he's mixing all these big albums. It's like, it's great for him. But I've, I watched this process start from when he was first mixing on a laptop, asking me for mixing advice, you know, and like how it's just sort of snowballed from there into what it is now. And it's all just very small steps, very small steps. And before you know it, I'm going to him being like, hey, teach me how to mix. 
because I suck. <laughs> Dude, he's a monster, he's, by the way. He's an absolute monster. He's an absolute monster, but it's not an accident. He practices all the goddamn time, and it's what he's obsessed with. On Man. tour, he would just be on his laptop, just mixing, just I believe testing, it. checking out, showing me like the differences between the aliasing, between this EQ plugin and that, and how this spectrum shows this and that. It's like crazy the amount of detail that he goes into. But then he uses it all, all that information so musically. Like you'd think like, oh, he's just being clinical. It's no, he's like he like he keeps that little information in the back of his head so that he can make educated decisions about the sound and like you know he'll set these weird like like uh experiments like he'll try to do a mix just with slate plugins you know and like he won't keep it but he's just like he's learning like what that does and that's in the back of his head and then if he has a problem he's like oh well have you ever thought you know i go to him with a problem i'm like man i can't get this down and and he'll come with this weird abstract idea that i'm like that's really clever how the hell did you think of doing that you know and it's literally just because he's experimented with just about everything at this point so that's the answer spend a shitload of time and be obsessed (laughs) you know i gotta say man we've done 13 nail the mix months already yeah and uh they're always they're always cool like i always learn something um we've had some great great people on but the one that nolly did man in september God damn, he is, he's heavy. Like, yeah, he's meticulous. He's, he's got, yeah, he's got some knowledge. He does, he does. And But but again, this is not like, I feel like so many people are so quick to write it off as like, oh, he's just smarter. Or it's like, I'm telling you, I've watched this motherfucker work. The amount of work that it. he put into it is why he's good. It's not because he's better or because he's got a better ear for that. or th- th- you know, It's like he does have a great ear for it, but you wouldn't get to the level that he's at just off of that. No one would. He's put in so much goddamn work, and that's why he knows as much as he does. And he uses that knowledge to, to benefit his ear. He's still at the end of this. At the end of his day, uh, of the day, he still trusts his ears. That's the number one thing that he does. Um, he just has all this knowledge to back it up, and that he does. Um, okay, here's one from Jordan Ambilton, which is from the armory of pedals you own. Which one do you find yourself coming back to over and over? Ooh. Does it have to be just one? <laughs> no. How about which ones do you find yeah, yourself? Um, okay, yeah. So uh, Caroline Caroline uh, Guitar Company has this uh, delay called the Kilobyte. You can actually probably hear that all over like uh, all over P3. And maybe Juggernaut. They have it for Juggernaut. But it's got this cool button that makes it self-oscillate. It's a great sounding delay. It's a great sounding delay. I, I always find myself using that. Same thing with the free the tone flight time. There's just something about it that just is so sick. Oh, and the Catalan bread uh, echo wreck. I, I love I love delays. The Afterneath by Earthquaker Devices is just absolutely nuts. It's I've never really played an effect that's quite like it. it's basically using all these like super cut up I, I guess granular delays to create a big long reverb. It's a really really cool effect. It's just so well done, and I've yet to pay, play another pedal that really nails what it does. And actually, like on an interesting point, Walrus Audio put out this overdrive called the 385, which is I not, like that it, company name. Yeah, Walrus Audio. Oh, they make great pedal. They make great pedals. Um, they um, but this this overdrive is not a tube screamer style overdrive. It's more like one that. It makes your amp sound like an old vintage cranked amp. And I got this uh, Marshall hand-wired amp uh, recently, which is sweet. But it's literally like the, the only controls are volume and tone. It's just a clean amp. But it loves pedals. And that, that 385 in front, of, uh, in front of that Marshall is a really special sound. Oh, and I've also, I also I haven't been able to talk about this for a while because I got this I got this in secret for a little bit. But uh, Way Huge sent me the Conquistador Fuzz, their Fuzz Distortion pedal, and I've been jamming that a lot. I just haven't been able to tell anyone about it because I guess I was like kind of beta testing it, but there was nothing wrong with mine, so it was good. But uh, yeah, those are uh, those are the ones I've been playing with a lot lately. I've been having some fun with fuzzes. Um, which is kind of a new thing because I never thought I'd be into fuzzes, but I don't know. They're fun. (laughs) I agree. All right, here's one from Adam Barnes, which is, what guitars, pickups, amp sims do you recommend for a guitarist who's chasing a select difficulty rhythm tone? Well, 
all I can recommend is what we used. So we used the Fractal Axe Effects. I literally just detailed earlier the exact Axe Effects tone. You can get yeah. that exact tone on the Axe Effects. So just listen to that. And if you've been listening, you already probably took that down. The guitars, um, because we're at my studio, we were using my Jackson Juggernauts, which have the bare knuckle Juggernaut pickups in them. And what, what else did he want to know? And, uh, and, well, I think you covered it. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, yeah. you covered it. Okay, so Yatin Srivastava, what advice would you give a band that is negotiating a deal with a label, and what are the advantages, disadvantages of label support? Oh, well, we, we, we talked about half we of cov- that. We covered that half of that, yeah. The, the advantages and disadvantages of label support nowadays are very different. It's like we're in an era where they don't have as much to offer like they used to. I mean, if you think about it, a label is supposed to be selling your, your stuff, but really... You know, physical sales have gone down a lot, like vinyls up, but like you can negotiate a vinyl deal with, with, you know, as a separate thing. You don't need to give up your masters for that. I'd say once again, know what you want, understand the climate that you're entering, and make sure you're getting something worthwhile. You know, like what are you giving up? Try to understand what you're giving up. I know nothing about this person's deal or their situation, but try to understand what you're giving up to get what you're getting. There is, to be perfectly honest, as much as I hate to admit it, there still is a sense of, you know, a little X factor or pizzazz or something of having label support. Even if it means absolutely fucking nothing at all. Um, There's something about it that just gives you an extra edge. And I think labels are going to use that to their advantage. But even that you know the industry's slow to change but it is starting to catch up like yeah what what is the what is the point of labels anymore you know they need to offer something and i've i've always thought that like labels and management would start to converge cuz they'd both realize that they don't offer enough individually to be able to charge what they do but that together it <laughs> might be a worthwhile thing and i think you see some labels that are starting to lean towards that but uh just make sure you're getting something worthwhile because yeah the, is you could probably release it yourself, put it up, you know, on TuneCore to get it up on iTunes, put it up on Bandcamp, you know, front front the costs of some uh, CDs and vinyl yourself and sell those. And it's like, would a label be doing anything more? Like, would they, would they, they might be doing something more, but would they be doing enough to justify what you're giving them? Would they be tripling the amount of sales that you're getting? I don't know. I I somehow sincerely doubt that. So it's a tricky one. Be smart. Yeah, I com- completely <laughs> agree. <laughs> so here's one from Ricky Whiteout. Um, well, two questions from Ricky Whiteout. Number one, do you see yourself doing film and or video game scores in the future? And number two, can we expect more top secret audio lessons like the drum programming one sometime in the future? Um so the the first one's video games, movies. I'd love to. I think what people don't understand is that people need to hire me for that. I'm slowly trying to chip away yeah. at that. I've had some opportunities, but it's not like I can just go knocking down uh, on their door and be like, "Hey, I'm ready to do video games and movies." And be like, "Oh, hey, come me. right along." I'm a nobody. I have I'm arrived. A, yeah, I'm a nobody in that world. You know, I'm trying to I'm trying to slowly make a name for myself, but I'm also trying to get better at that stuff. So, if you're listening. You want to hire me for a video game or a movie? And notice my my word. I said hire. That doesn't mean do anything on spec. (laughs) But unless it's a huge project, in which case I'll totally do it on spec. But yeah, feel free to hire me. Uh, For the lessons, (laughs) for the lessons, uh, the top secret, top secret audio stuff. I mean, that that's something that I tried out. And, you know, I think the better way to do that is like through the live streams. I've had a better response through all the live stream stuff. So I might I might explore that. But again, there's only so many hours in the day and I have to kind of use my time wisely and not forget to give myself some downtime like I did in the last month and made myself very miserable. So <laughs> I just have to be careful with that. But um, there will be more educational content coming out. I'll say that much, one way or another. Okay, Jack Hartley's asking, when you experience writer's block, how do you deal with it? Are you the type of person that writes constantly or do you have to be particularly inspired? No, I definitely need to be inspired. And when I force it, it usually doesn't work out well. There's a bunch of different ways to approach it. I, some, I just sometimes just take time off. 
I do other things. I do anything but music. And then like when you go back to it, it's like, oh yeah, this whole thing. And it's fresh again, you know? But I've less, I've learned not to force it. I've learned to have fun with it. Like you want to be having fun when you're doing it. Uh, it. It shows otherwise. So find your system. Um, if it's like you're having a writer's block on like a certain part, or if you're like kind of blocked at a certain part, Nolly gave me this one tip, which I thought was great, which was like, think of everything that you definitely wouldn't do. You know, what definitely wouldn't? come next what definitely wouldn't be the next riff and then you can sort of narrow it down because sometimes this sense of option paralysis is what sort of manifests itself as writer's block and when you have the power of a computer and everything you know i can make any style of music i want in front of me on my computer that can that can be what's sort of blocking the creativity so trying to find ways around that um can help maybe giving yourself some weird limitation or finding some some arbitrary way to to define what you're about to do like oh, you want it to be this vibe or that vibe or only use these instruments or whatever you know that can be a good way to spark it but if it's not happening don't force it that's my advice completely agree all right here's one from colin mcgeo which is in the early days starting out how did you go about finding musicians that had skills you sought for in musicians but also aligned with your musical visions goals was it purely friend referrals or did you make connections through some further education or did you use social media to reach out did you go through people that conflicted with your visions and goals before you ended up with the crew you have today and if so what difficulties did you have to overcome during any personal transitions and how did you overcome them? Basically, what's your whole life story? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, the, the funny thing is the answer to most of that is yes. <laughs> like, yes, <laughs> it was all of that. It was it was everything. Uh, it's really fucking hard to find band members. And the first band I was ever in was only one other band before Periphery, and it was called Bulb, and it was in Toronto, and it was with my best friend at the time. And it was that classic thing of, you know, he wanted to go in one direction, I wanted to go in another. It fell apart at the seams, and, you know we haven't talked since I, I don't think <laughs> yeah. not that I hold anything against the guys just that's the way that's the way I guess it worked out and we went our separate ways but it made me sort of realize like hey maybe you should just do it yourself you have the tools to do it yourself and in putting my music out then people were coming to me already understanding what it was so that that was no longer a conversation it was like hey i know what you're going for i understand what you're going for uh but it's still difficult to find people that you gel with like my advice is just don't settle it's a very long arduous process and you know we have a good lineup uh but it took a very 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 long time and it took a, a few member changes to even get to that point you know it's hard and the reason is, is because you don't know if you're good off the road. What are you like on the road? Well, you won't find out until you start touring. What are you like in the studio? What are you like in this situation? And until you've sort of encountered all these situations, you won't really know. And then the other half is the attitude. I'm so thankful to have a band that is introspective. When we have problems, we talk about them and we come out stronger because everyone is like, no one is like, okay, my shit doesn't think. Everyone's, if someone's doing something that annoys someone else, the attitude's like, oh shit, I made someone I really love and care about feel bummed out with something I did. I don't want to do that anymore. I'm really going to work on that. And with a different type of personality, that could easily escalate into like, uh, well, oh, you, well, okay, that's how it is. Well, then fuck you, I'm out, you know? And I think that's what does happen a lot, but, you know, a little bit by design, but I'm glad that it's worked out this way. The my band members are all like that. They're introspective. They're open to working on themselves. I've I've had that conversation with people. I've been the the recipient of that conversation. We've all had to work on on our personalities, and we are all trying to make this work as a relationship. So finding people who want to work with you, uh, both musically and personally, and I would put an, a, a big emphasis on personally. Because that's such a big thing that no one else sees, but that you have to deal with every day in very confined spaces. Like, that's that's the trick. And it's just kind of, again, knowing what you want, knowing what you're going for, and making sure that you're communicating at all points um, so that you minimize the amount of problems that you have and, and you don't let stupid things like resentment build up and, and explode into stupid fights, you know? Uh, but it's been a learning it's been a learning process man we're we're getting better at it too you know so here's one from Sasha Vino which is 
You say that you play your guitar DIs until you're rolling in Moog synths a lot of the times. It sounds awesome. Do you know any software synths that can do that? I hate program guitar solos into MIDI. Uh, I, d- I don't know that that's accurate. I don't, I don't put my guitar DI into the synths. Sasha Vino's been smoking the funny grass. What I what I do what I do <laughs> is I'll, I'll uh, some some lead lines I'll like program what I played on guitar and double that. But yeah, I don't. I I, I think you can, but like it would just be to like run the guitar like through the filter or something like that of the Moog. But I, I don't do that. Sorry. So, Sorry, Sorry Sasha. Well, actually, we have a question that kind of takes that a little further about that, which is from Joe Trumbull, which he says, Misha, I'm a gigantic fan of Periphery and would like to congratulate you on the Grammy nod, a nomination. I have my own opinion on the Grammys, but it's fantastic to see incredible music recognized by the mainstream. I've noticed from the Remain Indoors doc and such that you have made a habit of tucking synths under some leads, like some kind of magical sauce. Could you elaborate what kind of processing goes into this as well as what synths you're using? Um, so yeah, on the uh, on Periphery 3, uh, I had just gotten a Sub-37, a Moog Sub-37, really just to learn more about synthesis, but that, that damn thing sounds so good always that we just kind of put it you know when we're writing it's just like hey you have an idea try it out what's the worst that could happen and every time we would try it it was just like everyone was like yeah that sounds way better and it would sort of fatten up leads and just add this quality to it that was just very pleasant to the ears so we you know that that synth found its way onto pretty much every song on the album i also had a i got a korg mini log uh later in the in the, in the process so that was on there as well just to get like sort of a different sound and that's a poly synth the the sub 37 can only do one note at a time the mini log can do four so and we were also using soft synths and stuff like that but but the truth is i mean you can get good sounds with anything but it's great when you have something that just sort of works and that moog just worked it was just like we could focus just on creative because we really didn't have to do much processing sometimes we'd run that through the axe effects you know and get you know uh guitar style tones or or delays or whatever going on it or make it super ambient sounding but whatever we did it always seemed to just complement the sounds and the music very well so we just we just experimented and had some fun with it i've done that quite a bit as well and i just feel like it's uh I feel like my favorite mixes are ones that have very unique textures. Right. And there's just something magical that happens when you start layering sounds that you're familiar with with new kinds of sounds. Absolutely. Yeah, layering a rhythm line with a distorted synth or a a lead with a synth or, or, you know... it's almost the same idea as having a parallel compression on the snare, a really distorted right, right. compressed snare. Like it just it adds texture, and you could call it ear candy or whatnot, but it just makes makes recordings better. Well, here's the interesting thing: is that like you know, in a lot of these things, you might not realize that there's the synth there, but if I were to mute it, you definitely hear that something got lost. You know, there was something that's missing. And and that's the thing. You're not hearing necessarily just the synth or just the guitar, but it's like that combination, like you were saying. It's like that, that's a very pleasant sound. And so we've just been experimenting with that and playing a, a, around with that. Because, again, what's the worst that can happen? <laughs> it sucks and you don't use it. That's right, which is not that big a deal. Not that big a deal. <laughs> nope. So, Misha... I want to thank you so much for uh, coming on, being so generous with your time and so open with your answers. It's been fantastic talking to you. Yeah, man. No, thanks. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, Sorry for talking your ear off for almost two hours now. That's actually the secret to a podcast is that I... No, I don't have to talk, and you can talk. Yeah, exactly. I'll do, I'll just do, I'll do all the talking for you, you know? Uh, it's not a problem at all. I'm sure people wanted to hear what you had to say more than me anyway. Well, <laughs> but, and you're kind of sick, Joey. I don't, don't want you to ruin... You you sound sick. You you probably yeah. <laughs> you need to take some medicine or something. You've been sick for like a week now. Yeah, the don't go to Vegas when four hundred thousand people go to Vegas. Yeah, do you take do you say. take zinc every day? Yeah, I am taking zinc right now. Oh man, I've been taking zinc like every night before I go to bed for like the last three years. I don't know if it's a placebo effect or not, but I just don't get sick anymore. 
and it's no, like, that's real stuff, man. That's yeah. real. Zinc is is very powerful. Yeah. So like I I because I used to get sick like not often, but when I'd get sick, I'd get like sick for like a week, and now the worst I'll get is like a sore throat for like a day or two, and it's gone. But like it doesn't matter yeah. tour traveling whatever. So I just take that stuff religiously, and I take it before bed. Because it used to like kind of upset my stomach uh, if I take it even with a meal, it would just make me feel like nauseous. But if I yeah. take it before bed, if you're lying horizon- horizontally, you don't even have to go to sleep. But like as long as you're lying horizontally, it could be on an empty stomach, you'd be fine. So I just take it before bed every night, and it uh, it it's helped me out. So that's a little little tip for Joey, little tip for everyone else who uh, <laughs> I should start a zinc company. Yeah, <laughs> totally. You're on it. <laughs> Anyways, thanks so much for having me, guys. It's a lot of fun. Thanks for coming on, dude. Of course. See ya. This episode of the Unstoppable Recording Machine Podcast is brought to you by Joey Sturge's Tones. Creating unique audio tools for musicians and producers everywhere. Unleash your creativity with Joey Sturge's Tones. Visit joeysturgestones.com for more info. To ask us questions, make suggestions, and interact, visit urm.academy slash podcast and subscribe today.